Maybe I'm Casey, maybe I'm Casey, maybe I'm not. All right, very excited to have my friend MJ Acosta of NFL Network on the podcast again. How are you doing, friends? I'm good. Trying to keep myself calm, drink my coffee, and mind my business in this pandemic. <laughs> Uh, let's show everyone your froth. You got a new frother. It's very exciting. It's the single best Amazon purchase that I've made the entire pandemic, other than like every light on the universe <laughs> for my in-home studio. But yes, I'm, I'm actually, obsessed with frothing. I've been really good about Amazon. Um, I, I, I've not really bought anything I didn't actually need. I bought one thing that I didn't need. Well, I mean, you needed, was, the, you needed the frother. No, it wasn't the frother. Oh. <laughs> A crown. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. But you, you know crown. what though? Like it's it's part of the decor for your yeah. office. So I don't actually hate that purchase. Uh, it, I think I think great. like it was twenty bucks. Right, okay. and like clothes you're gonna wear outside. That's kind of a waste of, of money at this point. But um, other than that, if you're buying like comfy clothes, that makes sense. Um, but okay, so you're wearing your Dolphins cheer shirt, and I see your Dolphins. Uh, football behind you and you have your Dolphins mug so we should get started with some very sad news that we got yesterday Uh, the great legendary Don Shula passed at the age of 90 Um, just a sweet and generous amazing guy but you know as as always happens when when someone that you know that status passes you kind of look back on their career and their accomplishments and it's kind of it's staggering what Don Shula accomplished in his time in the NFL. Yeah. I mean, it's unmatched. Literally, it is yeah. unmatched what he has what he accomplished as a coach. But I think what he brought to the game, um, and of course, I'm biased in South Florida, in Miami specifically. He was everywhere. He was ubiquitous with South Florida and what the sports culture and what the sports scene there was. I remember my rookie season as a Dolphins cheerleader was the 40th anniversary of the perfect season so we got to wear these like 72 little jerseys out on the field and we honored Shula he was out on the field with us at halftime and it was just it was beyond you his presence just being there so I think that's I think what hits most people even if you're not from Miami right like you just know who he is as a coach uh, throughout the league and what he did for the game the early early days of the NFL it's 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 sad to see him go but I hold on to everything that he brought to everybody Right. And having only two losing seasons in his entire career, being the winningest head coach of all time, uh, all of the countless Hall of Famers that he coaches, he coached, obviously, the the 72 season, which as Dolphins fans, we hold on to for dear life. (laughs) life. um, Yeah, I mean, I was uh, we were talking about it yesterday. um, And obviously, you know, anybody who has ties to the Dolphins or South Florida, you know, was a a sad morning day for us. But I feel like to, to put put a, you know, I don't know, a, a ribbon on everything that Don Shula was. When I think of Don, I just always picture him. Um, he's just the Don. It's a perfect name for him. Yes. He was just like the Don. Yes. I just saw him at uh, NFL Honors. So he was, I was actually in, in the row, in his row. Uh, yes. So yeah, uh, sitting a few seats down from him. So I got to, got to say to, hello to him. And uh, head coach Brian Flores, which was, you know, you know, a very nice moment for me. But yeah, he's just, he's, he's one of those people that you just say his name and he's synonymous with greatness and you don't have to explain it. Um, so yeah, it's, it's nice to share that with someone from South Florida who understands the importance that Don Shula was to the organization. A hundred percent. I think anyone who's ever met him, like I love scrolling through yesterday and seeing all the pictures of the first time I met Shula and like the last interview I had with him. And like it, his expression was always the same. I was like, the kid, you just want to hug him. So uh, definitely a, a big loss for the football family. Yeah, he was the patriarch of the Dolphins organization, which I think that they put in the statement. And I thought that was a perfect way to yeah. describe what Don Shula was. So the Dolphins are going to look a lot different next year. We got our guy, oh, yeah. Tua Tungavailoa. Now, as we know, as everyone knows, I was I was holding out hope to yeah. the last second that they were going to pull some move and get Joe Burrow. <laughs> but, yeah. you know, when I talk about the Dolphins and Tua, um, I think I was just having this conversation yesterday. When it comes to Miami, Miami is a very hard place to describe to someone who hasn't spent a significant amount of time there. Miami right. has an image that, you know, the entire city is just this little sliver on South Beach. 
Even when LeBron nope. said he was coming to my, I'm taking my talent to South Beach. No, you're not. You're taking them to downtown Miami. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> they don't play in South Beach. We know what you're saying, but you know, there's there's a lot more to Miami, the city, yeah. the energy, the people than just South Beach. Actually, if you live in Miami, you probably don't spend a lot of time on South Beach unless you live there. So, it's like impossible to get over there, first of all. Right. So, but nobody understands this, right? So I'm, right. I'm trying to explain that my resistance with Tua to Miami wasn't that I don't think he's talented. And it's not that I think he's a fragile court like player. There are certain people, certain players just like, oh, just you're always hurt. It's like someone breathes in your right. direction and you're hurt. And that's not their fault, but it's just, they're just an injury prone player. I don't injury think that, that that is what Tua is. I think Tua is very tough. I just think he extends plays beyond what is necessary and puts himself in positions where he's half, he has to be more athletic than his defenders, right. which most of the case you're not. So that's what I think has been the result of, which has led to his injuries. But the, the bigger thing with Tua is fit. It's hard to describe when you think of the greatest players in South Florida history. They have some things in common. Dwayne Wade, right? When you think of South Florida yeah. sports, Dwayne Wade, you think of, of course, Dan Marino. Marino. You think of yep. my, my brother, Jason Taylor, mm -hmm. Jose Fernandez. You think of no. yeah. um, even, you know, Giancarlo Stanton for a while. Like whoever it is that's going to, to take over and win the hearts and minds of the the South Florida area, you got to have a little something with you. And, you have to have that. <laughs> yes. And it's hard to explain. I don't know. I don't know if Tua has that yet. And I'm hoping he does. And maybe we just haven't seen it. Because, you know, he's at Alabama. It's Nick Saban. And, you know, it, 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 I, I just don't know. Do you see that? Because I know you know what I'm talking about. You know about. when I saw it for the first time was on draft night. My boy came through with a full three-piece suit. If that doesn't say I'm ready to conquer – South Florida, I don't know what it does. I think he was the only prospect that night who actually still dressed up and made sure, listen, this is my moment. I'm trying to think back. We had folks in robes. We had a lot of jeans and t-shirts. I think he was the only one in like a full suit, a three-piece suit at that. I think so I'm that, with it. Yeah. I think now that I think about it, yeah, I think he was the only, everyone had their fit, but I, but I think he was the only one that was still in a suit. Like full suit. It was in, I mean, I loved it, but beyond just that little glimmer of swag that he showed us that night. Um, I think that he is the type of player who wants to prove people wrong. He's very well-spoken. He's very polished, which is great because you need that in your franchise quarterback. But beyond that, I think he has that grit in him. I think it's still to be seen. Um, but I think with all of the spotlight on him, especially with all of his injuries, that he will rise to the occasion. At least this is the fan in me putting, putting in a lot of faith that he'll pull it out and show us that he has that same gumption and that same sparkle and X factor that we've seen from uh, many Miami greats. Yeah, I think he definitely has, uh, he's a chip on the shoulder guy and he's a winner, which I like as well. But what sure. I like the most about what the Dolphins did in the draft this year, um, outside from drafting a lot of linemen, which is what you should do when yeah. you're rebuilding, but they also didn't have to move. They stayed very comfortably at, at the position that they earned at five didn't have to give anything mm -hmm. up and took the guy that they wanted because Herbert was available. Exactly. I think that they knew exactly what they were going to do going in. And they had, they had plenty of power, equity, draft capital to make it happen if they wanted to move or if they wanted to really pull out some kind of huge uh, trade, but they didn't. They've been eyeing Tua forever, Chris Greer and Brian Flores. This is the guy that they wanted. And I think it would have had to take like a monumental or like very, very negative medical report for them to sway from that. I think they had their mind made up a long, long time ago. So now the AFC East is obviously very different. Tom Brady, he's in Tampa. Down. Who'd have thunk it? But that's not where me. he is. <laughs> no, I didn't either. Um, but I like it now. I actually do. I've, I've completely come around on it. It took me a couple days for it to wash over me. And then I just, now, now I'm completely bought into it. I can't wait to see what happens. Not that I was happy. I was happy he left Bill Belichick and the Patriots. Right. I just didn't right. expect Tampa. But the AFC East is totally different now. So the last 20 years of our lives, we've Me been nothing. in peril. <laughs> yes, we just knew what was going to happen. Well, now uh, the Dolphins have their guy, and I like the direction that they're heading in. And even though they were tanking last year, they played really tough, and they're yeah. establishing a culture. I think that the Bills are still the team to beat in the AFC East. They're coming back with the same oh. quarterback and the same coach, which I think is huge. They for made a playoff run last year. Yeah, no. What, I mean, look, they fell apart in the second half, but – 
uh, but regardless, like you're going to get better every yeah. year. But I think specifically for this year, it's always important, but very specifically for this year with everything that's happening, the mm-hmm. teams that are bringing the same quarterback coach coordinator combination back are at mm-hmm. a decided advantage. So that's why I'm putting the bills obviously at the top of the AFC East. Now the jets, I think are interesting because Sam Darnold's not going to have mono. <laughs> Literally so, that's what I wrote in parentheses, mono question mono. mark. No mono. I mean, hopefully he knows how to avoid the mono. Uh, avoid the kissing disease. We got it. All right. Everyone's wearing masks. You should be fine. But I think New England is going to be terrible. And I don't, I, when, pe- when I say that, people like are pushing back on this so hard. I don't understand it. Unless you really truly believe that Jared Siddham is the next Tom Brady, what are you That's talking hard. about? We know what their defense is. Okay, cool. How many pieces, how many veteran pieces did they? Did they lose? And like, uh, it's not that I'm saying they're going to be terrible forever, but this year they are going to be the worst in the AFC East. Am I crazy? I don't think you're crazy. I think that's a very, very feasible scenario for the Patriots this year. Jared's been a bless his heart. Like we can make the argument, okay, he's been learning from Brady and, and Belichick for all of these years, just sitting there. That's not the same as being out on the field and being the guy. Nowhere near. You can't make the comparison. Now, if what I think may happen happens and they somehow feel comfortable enough with bringing in cam newton and cam newton is healthy no we're talking different different things but that's still a ways away at this point if we're just looking at the patriots as they are right now the pieces that they have and that includes jared Stidham as qb1 it's not gonna be cute in 2020 for the it's patriots. not gonna be cute it's gonna be not cute it's not cute what they're trying to do but okay so let's stop let's, let's talk about cam newton for a second because I, I love cam newton I, I think the media is extremely hypocritical about Cam Newton. We love having individuals like Cam Newton to cover because they're interesting and they provide content right. and they're discussable. But all of those things then make it a negative for him when it's time for him to find a job. I don't have a problem with Carolina moving off of Cam Newton at this point. Um, if you didn't see a future with him, this is the perfect time to right. do that. Bring in Teddy Bridgewater, who I, who I love. Um, I like him, yeah. Yeah, and Cam Newton should be a starter somewhere. However, you can't just flippantly say that, right? Like, lots of people should be things, but right, scena- right. situations and scenarios and environments affect that. The, the market is saturated at this point, okay? so Oversaturated. Right. So, yes, he should be a starter, but unless they're, you know, expanding the league at this point, everyone pretty much has their starter. Now, everyone doesn't have their backup, and we're seeing this with Andy Dalton, and Jameis Winston, who are starting quarterbacks in this league, okay? Yep. But there's no there's not a place for them right now. So they're taking these one-year deals at great organizations where they can develop or just reestablish themselves as clear starters. Jameis Winston, I think, is in a better situation than Andy Dolan, who I don't think will see the field much this year. Right. But, you know, we don't know what's going to happen with Drew Brees. Marcus Mariota, same thing, heading to the Raiders. Marcus Mariota, who I think – I think we know what Marcus Mariota is at this point, but that's fine. Like it's, it's a great situation for him. Who knows? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like he probably will see the field at some point this year. My thing with Cam Newton is, is he said he doesn't want to be a backup, right? Okay. Well then that limits you to someone getting injured and not just someone getting injured, someone getting injured who doesn't have one of these backups that we just mentioned. So if, Dak Prescott, I mean, God forbid, like, we're not wishing this on anyone. We're just having this conversation. No, no. Say Dak Prescott goes down. Well, Andy Dalton's in. Say Drew Brees goes down. Well, Jameis Winston's in. Or Taysom Hill, some combination of that. Yeah. Um, Teddy Bridgewater goes down. They're not bringing him back there. You no. know what I mean? So they're like 49ers, um, Oakland, or sorry, Las Vegas. Las Vegas. Uh, yeah. That was going to take a while. <laughs> um, you know, these are not situations for him. No. So I actually think. One, I think he should take a backup role. There's no, sh- there's no shame in that. There's no. Uh, I, I actually think it's. I actually think it could be a great chapter in your story for the next team for where you end up next. Like I think that would I, that will actually help Cam Newton. And not that I think he needs help because I think it's bullshit. He's in this situation to begin with, but he is in this situation. So like, don't worry about like why. Fix it. Solution oriented. That's what right? it is. Right. So you you don't want to take a backup role. I do think if he took a backup role, it should be with the Steelers. Oh, I didn't, why didn't I, I didn't think of that possibility? Their backup situation is trash. Atrocious. Mason, yeah. Yeah. Mason Rudolph and Duck Hodges, Hodges are not where it's at. As you said earlier, that's not cute. That's probably why I didn't think of it, because I'm like, who is even over there? Like behind. No, we saw right. them last year. Like they're not they're, they're not the guy. Right. 
And we don't know what Ben Roethlisberger is going to be. He's walking around here in this mountain man beard, okay, looking like he chops wood for a living. And, I mean, he's not. He's he, We're all talking about appearances all the time. Cam Newton, I mean, what is this? What is this, Ben? Like, you're scared. Right. What's happening? It's the perfect situation. Also, because Cam Newton is obviously a superstar. So this whole idea of this Tebow effect of you don't want to bring in a superstar backup. Well, no matter what Ben Roethlisberger does this year, outside of actually getting injured, no matter how bad he plays, they're not going to put Cam Newton in unless he's injured. It's just not the environment right. in Pittsburgh. It's not what Pittsburgh does. It's not how they roll. It's Ben Roethlisberger's team until his body forces otherwise. So right. it's it's actually a great situation. I like. I mean, look how well it turned out for Ryan Tannehill going right. to Tennessee. Look at him now. And look at the season that they had last year. I think it, it, it's super beneficial, especially, and they have similar similar injury histories here in that sense, where it was, I think he needed that time to like chill. All right, cool. I have a job, which of course is the primary uh, right. goal here is to get a job in the NFL. Um, I like the Steelers scenario. I think that would be great. And I don't think that Cam is, he's a smart guy. He knows if that's what he needs to do, that he's going to do it. NFL has more QBs than they know what to do with at this point, which I don't know if it's how long ago it's been since that's happened. I can't think of a time, truly. Um, but I, I'm, I'm thinking if he's like a Pittsburgh type of guy, like does he fit? We were talking about fit with Tua. Like does he fit in that? I mean, long term, vibe? long term. Yeah, kind of. Pittsburgh's kind of Pittsburgh's one of those places where it's very sneaky, flashy. Like, think of the triple Bs, Ben Roethlisberger, Le'Veon Bell, Antonio Brown. Was nothing subtle about the Steelers during that time. Troy Polamalu, (laughs) uh, Jerome Bettis, Terry Bradshaw, uh, Steel Curtain. Like, they're a flashy organization. Don't don't let the uh, Pittsburgh blue collar, you know, Steelworker City, uh, Iron City, swag for you there there it, it is a town that has a lot of pride and the Steelers specifically are a very flashy organization so it's not that I I, I actually don't think long term that wouldn't be a fit for him I do think it would mm-hmm. and once Pittsburgh embraces you like once the city actually embraces you yeah. then nobody can mess with you you You're have in. to you have to kind of get in you know and stay in because which once, is fair you know, we're, we're you know, kind of a petty city, you know, if we turn on you, it's not going to be very good for you. But, <laughs> but in the meantime, you're good. You're good. If you're ours, you're good. Um, so I actually do think it would be a fit there. I don't think he's coming, he would be coming there to replace Ben Roethlisberger, though. I think it would be a one-year situation. Mm-hmm. You have us all back up. You can see what Ben Roethlisberger is going to be moving forward this year to know if you need to draft right. a, a quarterback in the future, which is what I think they should do. But more importantly, you're in an organization, a respected organization in the Steelers, a, a cornerstone NFL franchise and you're backing up a future hall of famer for a year. So what? It's one okay. year. Okay. So speaking of the, the market being saturated, yeah. the, the, the Packers decided to pull a fast one on this and reboot the Brett Favre situation, right. which, which I feel like is, is very disingenuous to compare book for book. The, Packers situation with Brett Favre and Aaron Rodgers and the situation with Jordan Love and Aaron Rodgers. They're they're, they're two different scenarios. Aaron Rodgers is coming off a 13 and three season NFC championship game. Okay. And they ran into a buzzsaw in the 49ers, which, which, you know, very well. Right. I was there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, If you don't know, MJ covers the Las Vegas Raiders and the San Francisco (laughs) 49ers. Um, So, you know, very well what that team was. It was a hopeless situation, but they had a great season. And went to the NFC Championship game. Brett Favre, they were in the wild card game against the Vikings and lost the year that they took Aaron Rodgers. Right. So, yeah, it, it's not the same same situation at all. On, on top of that, many people felt like Jordan Love was extremely overdrafted and you traded up to get him. Okay? so I think that's the part that surprised me the most is that they traded up to get him. Right. So Like, what uh, is that saying? My thing is now, the, the, the conversations now are, okay, LaFleur sending a message to Aaron Rodgers. I'm just wondering, who is Matt LaFleur? <laughs> you just got here. You who are you? Got here. It's insane. I don't, is it a message or is it just like, no, this is what I want to do. This is the direction. I don't think that you and I are going to be a fit long-term. Like, is this the, like that ominous text message you get from a, from somebody right before they dump you? That's what I feel like this is. 
but it's not a subtle text. It's a very they no, like. I think you're... this is the like I'm like let me introduce you to my this is my friend, uh, mm-hmm. so and so, yeah. and you're like I've never met this friend before. Like no, you haven't because they're new, <laughs> right? <laughs> and they're soon to be a really good friend. It's one of those situations. I just I feel like the Packers were right there. I was really on the Packers bandwagon yeah. all season. And the way that people talk about the Packers last year is like, oh, they were frauds or frauds. Like they, they, they weren't really a, a good team. Like how? They beat the teams that they were on their schedule. They, they beat 13 of them. And then they beat some more in the playoffs yeah. and went to the NFC Championship game. So like, what am I missing here? How? I just don't understand how you justify that move at this point. Next year, maybe. But to not, to not try and go all in on a situation when you were right there last year, and take right. in the first round and trade up to get in the first round a quarterback who may or may not be ready in three years is not good management. It's a massive gamble, a massive gamble uh, on every level, I think, not just with what you're doing internally within the organization, but also with the structure now moving forward. And, and, and you're, you're sort of putting your chips on the table to say, well, maybe this will work out because nobody freaking knows what's going to happen once these kids get out there. And, He's not going to see the field next season. No. Zero percent chance. Zero He's percent not going to sniff grass. Nope. Not even a little. He does smoke grass. Though. So. You know that. <laughs> he can't get in trouble no more. Ha <laughs> ha. Um, okay. So there's been. um. The, oh, well, I guess I should ask you this because this is what I'm assuming happened. So Jimmy G overthrows Emmanuel Sanders in the Super Bowl. And all of a sudden, they're talking about possibly bringing in Tom Brady to replace him. Is there – I mean, I think it's insane. I think it's laughable. Like, it's it's insane. And we know this happened. Like, it's, I'm not making this up. Like, John right. Lynch said they had this conversation with Jimmy G. Is there any feeling in the organization, like, any actual shakeup about whether Jimmy G is the future of the 49ers? From what I'm told, and I've had several conversations with people, that's, that's not the case. That's not the tone. And they certainly invested, not only emotionally, but in a big paycheck to Jimmy G. And, and that's the direction they're going. And I think they see that he hasn't even really reached his, his peak potential as a quarterback. And he's just now getting into a rhythm with a group of receivers. They brought in a huge get now uh, through the draft. I think that that group is only going to get better, but it's really going to push him like, all right, we really got to see you be able to make these decisions on the field uh, and and really get the aerial attack going. Like obviously the run game dominated. So why would you not run the ball if it's working so well? And Kyle Shanahan is calling all of the, all the plays, right? But in terms of what his future is there, he's the guy. I mean, they're paying him a buttload of money. Like why would he not be the guy? Beyond that, they went to the Super Bowl. <laughs> Like, okay, but I'm saying one. though, like it's I, I agree. Like you paid him, and right. you, he had a, an incredible season. I After coming off the ACL, are you kidding? Like, right. I, you, all I could hear yeah. about all season was that the 49ers were going to win the Super Bowl, and there was there was no chance that the Chiefs were even going to pull it off. And he had one, like, okay, so he had like, a few mistakes in the Super Bowl. There's a couple moments where right. I'm like, I don't know what this guy's doing. But okay, that, somebody's got loose, and those will haunt him. For sure, sure, for the rest of like, his career. Even if they win this season, it'll haunt him forever, no matter what. Thing, like, don't but, throw the baby out with the bathwater? Right, right, I'm not right, really exactly. quite sure what that means, but I think that applies here. <laughs> it does. <laughs> Maybe just it relax. <laughs> it's all good. Calm down for two seconds. Two seconds. He did that. Yes, it was awful. It was in the biggest game of the year. It wasn't in, like, week five. It was in the Super Bowl. Nerves, you got to get that together. For sure, you got to get that together. All those mistakes. But what they've been building, because that's the thing. People think it's like this overnight success with the 49ers. They've been building that Super Bowl caliber team for three years now. And finally, it all clicked. And finally, everything came together. And their defense was unstoppable. And they had a three, sometimes four-headed monster in the run game. It's, it's, it's only going to get better from here as long as everyone stays healthy, right? Um, well, before I let you go, tell everyone you're doing this this really – cool thing with your fiance uh if you didn't see the yeah crazy uh the the video of me freaking out um I had had a few (laughs) tequila infused cocktails before MJ and David decided to spring that on me in all fairness but I lost my mind because I'm very I was very happy for you um and you are doing something very crazy with your fiance so uh explain 
for the record, David is still upset that you cried more than I did on our engagement. <laughs> That's not fair. <laughs> oh, he's still really mad about it. He's like, see, that's how you cry. That's how you cry. <laughs> I'm a hideous crier. So no, that's no. not how you cry. Well, you do look but what we're doing is, and, and your brother and his fiance, Monica, Jason and Monica were the very first ones to help us out in this. So what we're doing is we're going to the lope. As soon as all of this is lifted and we're able to, we're going to drive up to Napa and just lock it in. Seal it. We don't know what's coming. So we didn't really want to wait any longer to be married more than we needed to. But we figured, you know, everybody's so distant right now because we have to be like, let's do something fun that brings them together, our football fam. So what we're doing is different couples throughout um, our sports life are helping us pick aspects of our elopement. And whatever they pick, we have to do on our elopement day. So Jason and Monica helped us pick our venue. So we are getting married at the courthouse. We can't change it. That's it. It's the courthouse. The other options that we gave them were a vineyard or a wine cellar, which the guys were very excited about. Yeah. Um, but courthouse won. So uh, we had Cam and Nikki Jordan, Cam Jordan from the New Orleans Saints. Um, they picked um, what our little reception of for two is going to be. So that'll be dropping this week as well. So it, it's been really cool um, to see everybody sort of really get on board and, and embrace this. Of course, Jason and Monica had to postpone their wedding. So I... They were so gracious in helping us out, but they knew, like, they know what, what having to rearrange your life, a uh, big life milestone in the middle of this is, so it was perfect. Yeah, and where can everyone find the episodes of this? You can just go to my IGTV, and the series is called Calling an Audible. That's what we're doing with this whole little bit. That's so cute. Um, yeah, my brother has had to reschedule his wedding four times now. Which is really crazy. I mean, the, the good thing is that they had it plans, I guess. Yeah. So you just have to call the vendors, which at this point, right. I'm sure she's probably just texting them like, yeah, new date. But <laughs> like, um, yeah, but yeah, no, it's I mean, it put everyone's lives on, on hold. And obviously, you know, the, the priority is is health and, you know, safety and, um, you know, making sure that we pay our bills and all that stuff. But yeah, I mean, that's, you know, getting married is is the biggest day of your life. And, you know, as you could tell from my hysterical freak out, we've been waiting for this. So, yeah. <laughs> um, so. we're, we're going to have the party for the record, just like whenever the world is safe to do so. Again. Oh, so you are. Okay. So you're going to, are you going to yeah. have a ceremony too, or you're just going to have the party? Nah, probably just the party. Just the party. Okay. Maybe so something we, symbolic, but yeah. Can we still do the bachelorette? Uh, of course. That's the okay. main reason. Why we're okay. You know, that's party. the only reason I care when people Be are <laughs> Let's do it. Like, I'm like, okay, great. You're getting married. Cool. Where are we having the best ride? Yeah. Um, that group that is going to be hype. Post-apocalyptic bachelorette. I, it, listen, you know how I am at bachelorettes pre-apocalypse. So, right. yes, the turn up is going to be significant. I can't so wait. So real. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. Well, thanks, babe. It was really fun catching up with you, um, talking Shula and some football. Um, can't wait to see you hopefully soon. Oh. Hopefully soon. I think in, in a couple weeks. In a couple weeks, hopefully. Yeah, let's um, hope. Yeah, well, stay safe. I love you. Uh, and make sure that you follow so MJ at MJ Acosta TV. And you can catch her on NFL Network and check out Calling an Audible on her Instagram TV also.